I have to say this is probably the most expensive Civic I've ever sat in. And you might want to know why someone would spend this much money. And I have the straight answer for you. I got problems. The interior of this 2000 Honda Civic Si looks almost original. Go figure, Matt bought this for around $25,000 because it is almost impossible to find a pristine example of something like this. All the Civics of this generation have been destroyed or in a junkyard or modified to the point of you don't want to own it. So when he approached this, he wanted to keep it as original and reversible as possible, meaning the parts that he put on somebody could take off, like the S2000 steering wheel that's wrapped in Alcantara. The head unit can be easily reversed. It has factory floor mats, Mugen floor pedals or pedal covers. It has a spoon shift knob here because this is the exact shift knob he had on his 2000 Civic back in when he was 16 years old. So there's a lot of thought here that went into what he wanted when he was a kid versus what he can do in the modern era. Now, the biggest change, the Mugen King Motorsport seats, which are based on the Recaro SR7s. They are one of the best aftermarket seats in the world but they carry a hefty price tag. The rest of the upholstery, it's leather. Can you believe that? Well, Honda did not offer leather in this generation Civic, which forced the dealers to do an aftermarket add-on so people would actually pay to get the seats leather wrapped. But again, this was a generational choice. Everything else in here looks very standard Civic stuff. The trunk, let's talk about that. It has been reworked and dyno matted. And this is a part of the entire audio system, which I'm going to cover in the shop. So let's head into Matt's obsessed garage to talk about all the finer details. We are at Obsessed Garage, Matt's home base, and this is your Honda Civic that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, this was the car I had when I was 20, 19, 20, I think I sold it when I was 22, and uh, I, my friends make fun of me to this day when I, uh, when I sold the car, I bought it for 12,000 bucks, I put 30,000 into it and sold it for 12,000 bucks. <laughs> Uh, I managed money for many years, and needless to say, none of those friends ever hired me to manage their money when I was a financial advisor. But yeah, this is the not the exact car, but the same model, same spec. This is a 25,000 mile variant of a you know EM1 Civic Si that I had when I was that age, and I've, I'm double that age now. I'm 40. <laughs> uh, but what I'd wanted to do with this was just. Again, just experience that dream, bring people along with me, do as much as I could myself, uh, partner with some other guys that are like me in mm -hmm. their respective fields in LHT and Sound and Motion in Boston, and then you know have guys like you come down and experience it with me, and then we can send it on to the next, to the person. next planet, <laughs> the next person, yeah. Cars are really not that logical. A lot of the things that we do in our life, whether it's our homes or cars or relationships, they're not really based on a, B, C, they're not in an order. They're, and this is a great example of, this isn't a very black and white build. It's something kind of emotional for you somewhere that you had to do. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the reason I bought this car was to complete 
the chapter, you know, that, that chapter that I felt like never got completed because how many times have you done this in your life where you, you, you get the next car, but you certainly can't swing both of them. And so you're, I'm always reaching for the next progressive step. And so this car left before I completed it. And I doubt I would have, I certainly wouldn't be able to do it at this level. Uh, but the, the point of this for me was to, was to finish the job, to finish the project. Uh, within you know really an unlimited budget i didn't i believe if i could have spent 10 grand and finish it i would have much rather have done that i just started buying stuff and then my cfo added up at the end of the day how much money i spent and he did that you know the, the, the head shake <laughs> and uh and so the the intent wasn't to to spend a bunch of money the intent was to finish the job if you will and now you know this car will move on to the next person and i'll be done with it but i've been thinking about this car for 20 years you know, thinking about should I buy one, would I want one. Uh, after getting in if the first drive, I, I knew I didn't want it <laughs> more than for a few months. Yeah. A few months to, you know, it was cool to put the sunroof down and listen to some Wu-Tang while I'm driving down the road. And then I needed to do that once and that's a completed chapter for me. So that, that's what this thing has been all about since the beginning. I'm in Obsessed Garage. Before we talk about the mechanical changes, we need to talk about the audio system. And this is a huge expense. Matt spent $24,000 on the audio system, and you heard that right. And half of that is labor. This entire car's audio was done by a gentleman who has made a life of car audio and enclosures. He's a true craftsman. And I'm gonna show you some of the, the video of his creation of this, and that's what makes this special. I have a true appreciation of that, regardless of the cost. He's used off-the-shelf Dyn Audio speakers. There is the GS9 Sony head unit, and then his amplification in the back. The main thing is the, how does it sound? Well, when I first got in here, the, the main thing that I noticed was it lacked a little bit of brightness. We did a video on explaining audio testing. I'm gonna put the link up here so you can watch that. And then the bass was out of control. So I went in here and there is an amplification knob that I tuned by ear based on what I thought would sound like a really flat experience. We did the audio testing and what it shows is for a Civic of this generation, it is remarkable, not only one, the bass response, and the frequency response in the lower end, we're talking like uh, 60 hertz all the way up into the mid-range. And this is where you lose some of that, the brightness that he didn't want. But enough of it. Let's take a look at the underbody of this car. So Mark, underneath the Obsessed Garage Civic SI, tell me about it. So he took a 2000 SI. EM1. EM1, perfect condition, 25 grand. And he wanted this because when you look at it, it, this is extremely rare to find one that is not rotted out at this point. Subframes aren't rotted. All the sealers look good. There's no surface rust. So pristine example to build on that. Now you might ask why spend 25 grand? When he could have bought a regular Civic. Right. Like that was a, clean. That was clean, but it's still, again, it's hard to find. So he did that, gutted it, took the engine out, put an Integra Type R motor in it, JDM Integra Type R, B18C did some suspension changes front and rear, and then of course, wheels, tires, sound brakes, system. sound system. So let's start with the front. So Mark, with the EM1, walk me through what this car originally was before Matt did Matt stuff. Well, you know, you go back to the 80s and 90s Hondas and they all, their compact cars like this, they were revered because they were so nimble, so light, and we're gonna put up the, the weight chart here, and this is more heavy than a traditional SI because it's got so much sound insulation and stuff in it. But at 2,600 pounds, you know, you shave off a couple hundred pounds, you didn't need a lot of horsepower. So subsequently, you know, you had double wishbone suspension for that era, was great dynamically. The car had great feel, great rotation. It just felt light all the time and engaging to drive. Again, for a car in that time period, this didn't really exist. Most of the other combat cars from the American companies were just horse shit. Mm -hmm. So this was like, you know, leagues ahead. Um, so this went on for like three generations. And then in the 
uh, seventh generation Civic, they moved away from all of this. Like the shared pieces, they went to struts, they flattened the floor in the they back. They econoboxed the car, they really. Econoboxed. This was still an econobox, but it was a fun econobox, and that's why it, it pull, had so much weight. They got rid of, or they compromised a lot of the drivability for further usability in later yes, generation and Civics. higher volume sales, and that's exactly what they achieved. What about the rear suspension architecture? The rear is a trailing arm, you could call it a multi-link. But again, it's independent suspension. The subframe is, well, it doesn't have a removable subframe, it's integrated. So what you'll see in the back is a change in a sway bar, a, a subframe brace. And then of course he painted calipers, did an upper adjustable control arm for camber, but it's got factory toe in the trailing arm, uh, arm in the back. But really most of it is, for the most part, there hasn't been anything changed. And his philosophy about the modifications, which we're about to get into further, all of it had to be removable. He didn't like the cut philosophy. Yeah. Everything about this car, at least in his mind, can be returned back to stock. Yeah, and then it can be a collectible, and it's still a collectible as this. So front suspension, he did Moton three-way adjustables, and he had Moton revalve a race shock with external canisters to be revalved and spring rated into a street setup, which again, we're not gonna get into why. I think he's already explained that. You have spoon two-piece calipers, which you know are very OEM-ish. They're you know the the brand that makes the spoon calipers make OEM calipers, so it's got that look and feel. He's got hard race upper control arms that have sliding ball joints for camber adjustment. The lower control arms are just OEM units that hard race put harder bushings in, spoon rigid collars, a lot of just reinforcement stuff here. In the back, you did a sway bar that has adjustable end links so you can neutral out that preload if you need to. But again, mostly bolt-ons because that's what he loves. So Mark, let's get underneath the hood. All right. So Mark, where's the 1.6 liter? It's on the pellet behind you, Jack, for the lucky person that blows this thing up and needs a new motor. So what's in its place? Well, the stock Civic American SI came with a B16A2, which is sitting behind us. What he put in here was a Japanese or JDM spec B18C engine out of the Integra Type R. So what are the differences between the 1.6 liter and the Japanese 1.8 liter? So the Civic's got the 1.6, the Integra's got the 1.8. The B series is the same engine family, so they're essentially the same other than displacement, some engine tuning, and RPM. And because of all the internal modifications, which I'm sure you're about to tell me, this thing revs up to 9,000 RPM and makes slightly less than 200 wheel horsepower. Let's talk about that. LHT Performance did the swap. So they took that Japanese spec engine and transmission, five speed manual with a helical style limited slip differential applied Han data tuning to it because they did some changes internally. They put high compression pistons, did some rework of the head or cleanup of the head, changed bearings internally, and also added a skunk two camshaft and cam sprocket. And there's other little things too, like the Toda header, the test pipe. And the tuning they did, and I'm not trying to oversell this, is remarkable. It feels factory. I, what I mean by that is when you're driving this car, it feels like what Honda would have done. Yeah, it does. It, 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 that's the best part about this build is the engine swap and tuning is so competent. But one thing that does drag the entire thing down is the hard race, not the hard race, the has sport solid engine mounts. It is horrible in this car. And because the motor is not balanced, all of that resonance, that frequency that's coming off of this thing is being translated into the entire cabin into what is fundamentally a street build. Speaking of street builds, tell me about this, quite frankly, gorgeous Mugen strut tower bar and uh, Moton dampers. Yeah, so you have the Mugen strut bars front and rear and because you know they're, they're not making all the old parts that they used to, so there's very minimal Mugen parts for this car anymore. So this is one of the things he got to add. The Moton external damper or reservoirs are mounted to the, the shock tower bar here. And I think this is one of the most ridiculous parts. And then, you know, it's, there's contradictory things about this build, right? You spend $20,000 on an audio system that as soon as you turn on the car from it. the vibration and the sound destroys the audio system. And you're taking race shocks to turn them in a street thing. And but you again, could have made it a faster car too. Exactly. But again, this was his dream of what he thought was that perfect build, not what everybody else does. I will give Matt this. He managed to do all of this without the support of the original forums, because sadly, they're all gone. Yeah, that knowledge base has been lost. Social media has killed off forums and whatever's left, it's really, the databases are really hard to search. You know, Honda Vision, automotive forums, all that stuff is gone now. And, you know, so he went and took the money and just to figure it out himself. And I think that's what's 
makes this special to most people. It, it, it is very unique. Men at a certain age really do love their JDM cars, Mark. God, let's just take this out on the road. I know it's not a BMW, you're not interested. Jack, what does a $140,000 Civic sound like? You finally showed me your 3K Civic with a few simple mods, Mark. Yeah, I could smoke anything now. this car is wrong. Yeah. Really, it is. There's so many things wrong with it, from the audio system being in a tin can, to race-type dampers that shouldn't be in here. I mean... The solid engine motor yeah, mounts. Right, yeah. right. I mean, it's just so stupid, and that's also... It's obviously not designed by me, and not designed for me or anybody else. It is his car, and we both agreed that when we drove here, this guy has a collection of cars that are identical to the ones that we would buy and own. But we GT4, would... GT3 RS, the world's greatest E92, this thing, and a Raptor. And he has a, had an S2000, yeah. and, a, and a GT350, right? Yeah. So, but we would own them for the complete opposite reason that he would, but yet we find the same, we find the beauty in the same cars that he does. And I think that's what I feel driving this. I'm the same age, or almost the same age as him, I like the same cars growing up, but I would never spend this kind of money on a Civic. Nor would any regular or person. Or any regular yeah. person, but it's amazing that we get to live through his experience of why he did it, and to be able to be behind, be behind the wheel of a car that somebody was crazy enough to do all this shit is remarkable. So let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about one thing. This entire experience is dominated by the transmission and engine. So. You know, it's been retuned, and we talked about this in the shop. You drop it down in a second. So, the the engine tuning and the engine design, and in terms of the swap, this is an amazing job. And I've been in a lot of engine swap cars in my life, and they feel horrible. What LHT did with this swap, the, the engine build, the tuning, is about as perfect as you can. If you thought to yourself, what would a 90 Civic that felt like a 90 Civic kind of Type R, Integra Type R feel like, and that's what this is. The ECU tuning is very similar to what an OEM's ECU tuning would be for this power plant. With a higher red line. Yes. And it, it does make a little bit more power, but never for a second think this feels fast. And that's what's weird. When I first revved it, I'm just going to come to a start, a stop here and go in first gear. It's just... All it's doing is making noise. <laughs> but like most Hondas, because there's no torque... <laughs> it's like, I can't believe there's so many RPMs, but once you get it going, it really does pick It's a up. momentum car. It because is. it makes no torque anywhere in the RPM band, you have to get it moving, much like an S2000. Right. And once it's going, it's legitimately quick. It is, and I think, so there's a couple things that disappoint me about this car. One, it just does not need Moton dampers. And even on the softest setting, I'm really impressed at how well they do on the street, but they're completely wasted. Three-way adjustable, you know. <laughs> 
the other thing is he doesn't have the alignment and quarter balance set up yet. So, you know, it, you can feel things wrong with how... It's not quite dialed in. It's not dialed in in terms of suspension. So I don't have the confidence to, like, really push this thing through the corners. There's not enough stroke in the rear dampers or the suspension is so low in the back that you kind of feel it skating a bit. Um, and, and there's some geometry stuff that he needs to fix in the back, but you know all of the stuff that he's put in here, whoever's going to own this eventually has all the overhead to tweak the EQ for the head unit and the stereo the way they want it. The suspension can be changed, the ride height, the dampers can be changed to however you want, and that's what you get into with tuner cars. So take a step back for a minute. Talk about the core inputs, the fundamentals of the car. Steering, brakes, gearbox, power delivery, and the basic character of this architecture, so the suspension. I'm going to talk really about, you know, one thing. The the engine and trans, because they're mostly untouched Honda, right? Yeah. You have a helical limited slip on the front, so you don't get the torque steer, you don't get the weird pulling on the wheel, it always puts power down. The steering is slow. It's an, it's an SI steering rack, and this was fast for the era, but when you drive it now, you're like, holy shit, I got a yeah. circus wheel this thing around to get through a corner, and that's the big thing that's changed and that you notice right away. There's a lot more steering input. It's but, like an NA Miata and how slow it is. Right, but it's hydraulic, you still feel something, and then, of course, you have solid motor mounts, so you basically feel fucking everything, everything in here. I, I think it, this is so surprisingly good today. It does translate well. Um, you had double wishbone. The, the dynamics are all really solid, but again, we we can't talk about all the modifications. We can only talk about the engine. Gearbox is phenomenal. Pedal box for a shit box. Yeah, economy you know, car. economy car is amazing. It's it's essentially flawless. The heel toe, the throttle response. I mean, it's not like you know individual throttle it's body M3, M3 yeah. or like LFA, but I mean. This is why people love naturally aspirated motors. This is why Matt has gone to the cars that he did is because of cars like this when he was young. We all want the evolution of this, the big boy version of it, and this was the starting point for so many of us, and that's why I appreciate it. You have the nostalgia that I don't because you grew up with this car, yeah. and that is, I can't discount how powerful a tool nostalgia truly is when it comes to buying the cars that you love. Yep. And I think that's a good point, Jack. Final thoughts. All right. Final thoughts on this preposterously expensive Honda Civic Si. And when I heard Matt was doing this build and I saw how much money he was blowing, I thought he was crazy. I thought it was a total waste, a total joke. And the more I thought about it and the more I talked with him, I kind of understood. I did a video about nostalgia recently, which kind of talks about this. And I'm no stranger to this car. I had one in my early 20s that I scraped money together for. And even in my 30s, I bought one purely out of that. I wanted that car back that I had again because it was bulletproof reliable. I knew I didn't have to do anything. There was no technology on it. And then I could have gotten killed as I got T-boned by a minivan. And that's where my story ended with it. So I felt like Matt's journey, all this cost that he spent, is something that most of us can only dream of doing. And that's what it was. It was kind of a dream for me to see this car actualized, having that B-Series engine that was kind of designed for that car, the things that we could have done back in the day. And we, most of us have learned our lesson that it's not worth it. But for Matt, I think he's gone through it. Now, the last thing is Matt is not completely crazy. He owns an automotive business that he's built. And this has allowed him to do this build, but it's also allowed him to give this car away. If you go to obsessgarage.com, you can read about the build, find out all the nitty gritty, all the details, and how you could potentially enter to win it. So obviously, if you're watching this video after the fact and the car has been given away, well, all of this still stands. We do things with cars that don't make a lot of sense, and it's a very individual thing. Like every tuner car, I went in expecting something to be wrong, and there was. There's always something wrong with a car that you start to modify. But the joy that it can bring you, if you have a connection to it, is beyond words. And I'm grateful to have traveled 34 hours and spending 80 hours to make this video to kind of share that experience. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>